Um, as most of you know, I teach through books of the Bible, and that's what I've done for the last 17 years since I've been the senior pastor here. And when I came to Isaiah, I can tell you it was intimidating. It was intimidating to take on this book because, uh, as you have found probably, it is a different type of book because you're looking at, in this book, two different realms. You're looking at the here and now that Isaiah is speaking to and the not yet. And so there, it is a prophetic book that is speaking to its contemporary audience and then it's speaking to an audience in the future and then, as I have learned, it is speaking to us today. And as I started Isaiah, I had no idea the true relevance it had for every one of us today. But that's the way the Word of God is. And when we look at Isaiah, the main, one of the main consistencies we see in Isaiah in the area that we're looking at right now, which is dealing with false gods and idolatry and those who follow them, is that that is a subject that's relevant for every generation all through history. Because here's what is true about man. We will worship something. We have that built into us. God put it there. And we will either worship the one true God, our creator that we have sung about this morning and lifted our voice to, or we will worship something else. And again, in Isaiah's time, they typically worshipped statues and uh, things made of wood and silver and gold, and they made their gods and they worshipped those. But at the same sense, they also worshipped the idols that we tend to worship. They worshipped the idols of power and money and all these things that people chase after in order to try to find some kind of purpose, some kind of security, and some kind of significance. And so whether we're talking about a society that was 2,700 years ago that Isaiah was writing to, or you're talking to ourselves in this day and time, the subject really doesn't change. Because people are pretty much people wherever they are and whenever they live. But God in this section that we are looking at, and we will finish this mini section next week. And again, what we found is Isaiah is broken up into two major halves. And the first half was chapter 1 through 39. And then the second half we're in now. And even in that there are subsections. And this one is dealing specifically with the false gods, and a courtroom setting. And again, this is the image we need to see. There's a courtroom setting going on, and God is presiding over the courtroom, and He's saying, all of you peoples, bring your gods with you. Literally, you can take your statues and all of them into court, and put them before me, and show me with those statues how they are gods. Show me if they can do anything at all. And specifically, he's dealing with, in this section, Babylon and their statues. But before we look at Babylon again today, I want to do a little bit of review because a lot of you have missed over the last few weeks because of weather, etc. And so I want to look at this courtroom setting where, first of all, as God challenges them, he also makes very clear decorations. And this is the first one. The Lord is God. And He created the heavens and the earth and put everything in place. He made the world to be lived in, not to be a place of empty chaos. And I want to stop for there just for a minute. In the world, it often looks like it is a place of chaos. Individually and corporately. Would you agree? It sometimes doesn't look like there's anybody in charge. Now, why is that? We're going to talk about it today. And if you look at the title of my sermon today, it is Satan's 
dominion. He is the prince and the power of the air. And he is in control of many forces in the world today. And he can be in charge of our chaotic lives if we allow him. But the Lord is saying, I am not a part of that. I am the Lord. I created the world not to be that way. And he says, there is no other. And again, as proof that he is the only God, God uses Scripture. And by the way, our greatest defense of the faith is the Bible. And it stands above every writing in all of history. Why? Because it's words from God's mouth. And one of the specific things that helps us to understand that is the prophecies. From the very beginning of the Bible till the last words of the Bible is prophetic. It is speaking about the future. And then God brings that future to pass. And He did it in the Old Testament through the prophets. And specifically in this passage we're looking at, He names a guy by the name of Cyrus. And his name will come up again next week. But he is named multiple times in this section of Isaiah as proof that he is the only God. And I'm going to look at just one verse today that started this section about Cyrus. When I say of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he will certainly do as I say. He will command, rebuild Jerusalem, and he will say, restore the temple. Now again, Isaiah is writing this a hundred years before Babylon destroys Jerusalem and Judah and carries the people off into captivity. Babylon isn't even a strong nation at this time. And then he commands that a hundred years before he is born, that a Persian king by the name of Cyrus is going to defeat Babylon, and he will command the Israelites to go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the city and rebuild the temple, and he's going to pay for it. And again, history says that Daniel actually brought this passage to him when he conquered the city of Babylon and read it to him. And he obeyed it. And he did that. But beyond that, he also makes another declaration, which is key to this section of Isaiah. And that declaration is, and it's important to understand this, that declaration is that God is not just the God of the Jews. He's the God of the whole world, and He offers salvation to all the world. And that's what He says in verse 22. There is no other God but Me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none but Me. Let all the world look to Me for salvation. For I am God, there is no other. And again, it's so important to understand. The Scriptures are not for the Jews. They're for you and me. The story in the Old Testament is not about the Jews. It's about us. It's about everyone. God singled out the Jews to bring forth the message. But the message was always for the whole world. And we need to understand that because it is not set for certain peoples. It's for the whole world. And again, this is fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross and offers salvation to the whole world, and everyone who turns to Him will be saved. We concluded chapter 45 with one more statement, and that is this. The Lord makes this declaration, and He says, I have sworn by my own name, and I have spoken the truth, and I will never go back on my word. And He speaks into the future, and He says, Every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. And again, as we talked about that, that will either be voluntarily in this world or it will be at the day of judgment. The people will declare, the Lord is the source of my righteousness and strength. And again, Paul quotes this passage and uses it and speaks specifically to people that will surrender and bow a knee to Jesus. In Philippians, he says this, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Last week then, we looked at chapter 46, which then brings a focus to Babylon and to its gods 
again in this courtroom setting. And we started off the passage looking at the two gods of Babylon, and he is again prophesying when Cyrus carries them off into captivity. And this is what he said. Bel and Nebo, the gods of Babylon, bow as they are lowered into the ground. Lowered to the ground. They're being hauled away on ox carts. The poor beasts stagger under the weight. Both the idols and their owners are bowed down. The gods cannot protect the people and the people cannot protect the gods. They go off into captivity together. And I mentioned last week, and this is one of the main teachings last week, is that false gods, idols, are always a burden. They can't help anyone. And again, we can apply that to our own lives. When we start chasing after false gods, they become a burden. And they weigh us down and they cause trouble. They can't help us. And I also mentioned last week in this passage, I just wonder what very valuable, important things the Babylonians left behind so they could get their gods on the carts and take with them. Their food, clothing, important stuff. But don't we do the same? We can leave behind the most important things chasing after our idols. But in contrast to the burden of worthless idols, the Lord promises to take care of His people and carry them. And that's what He said also last week, which was the other main point we looked at. In verse 3 and 4 He said, I have cared for you since you were born. Now I want you to just stop and just ponder that for a moment. I have carried, cared for you from the moment you were born. Yes, I carried you before you were born. I will be your God throughout your lifetime until your hair is white with age. I made you and I will care for you and I will carry you along and save you. And the point I made last week with this is this. God has promised to care for His people from the moment of confession, conception until we die. And the question we need to ponder for ourselves is, do we really believe this? And do others see it in our lives? Because this is our testimony. Does the, your family, your neighbors, and the rest of the world see you trusting God, especially in your times of trials? When you're going through difficulty, are you holding on to God in faith? Or are you whining and anxious and complaining and looking for sources to fix your problem? And I will confess this. There are times in my life I do a really good job with this. And there are other times that I don't. But God wants us to always trust Him. This week we are going to pick up with the second part of this passage on Babylon. And again, if we'd had time last week, we would have looked at both of them, but uh, you guys won't stay past noon. You'll get up and walk out. So we have to split it up. And uh, we're going to look at Babylon again this week. But as we look at ancient Babylon and the prophecy against it, I want to look at a previous teaching we did in Isaiah many months ago where Babylon is more than Babylon. And what do I mean by that? I want to look at a passage that is also speaking of Satan. And this is in Isaiah 14. And I want to just look at one little section of that passage with you this morning to bring it to, to pass. It says, How are you fallen from heaven, O shining stars, son of the morning? And again, there, if you look at this, most scholars, and I agree with them, this is speaking of the fall of Satan from heaven when he was enthroned in heaven there. Not enthroned, but he was there. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountains of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high God. Instead, 
You will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. Everyone there will stare at you and ask, Can this be the one who shook the earth and made the kingdoms of the world tremble? Is this the one who destroyed the world and made it into a wasteland? Is this the king who demolished the world's greatest cities and had no mercy on his prisoners? Again, as we look at this passage, it cannot be about just Babylon and the king of Babylon. Why? Because it's too broad. It's speaking of the whole world. It is specifically about the king of Babylon in a narrow sense, but it's about Satan and Satan's dominion in his realm. And so we see, as we look through this passage, we are looking at a dual prophecy. We're looking at Babylon, specifically ancient Babylon, and we're also looking at Satan as we go through this passage together. And to give you understanding of how the whole Bible looks at Babylon, I want to give just a couple of verses in the New Testament that speaks of Babylon in this universal sense. The first one's in 1 Peter. Look at what Peter says. Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings. Now let me ask you a historical question and geography question. At the time in the first century when Peter is speaking, did the city of Babylon even exist? Nope. Wasn't around. And almost everyone who looks at this passage is speaking as if Peter is in Rome, which is what history tells us where he died not too long after this. So here Babylon represents Rome. Now what it is it about Rome that would mean it's Babylon? Well, it was a world center of power at that point in history, and it was evil and opposed to God's reign on the earth. And so Babylon here is the city of Rome in the Roman Empire, not the Babylonian Empire. And if we look in Revelation, there are multiple verses that talk about Babylon, and I just want to talk about one that speaks of the destruction of Babylon there, that also mirrors what we're going to be looking at today, and that's in Revelation 4, 8, 14, 8. Then another angel followed him through the sky shouting, Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. Because she made all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality. Now again, this is the def definition of Babylon that we need to understand. It is a demonic entity that has the world following it and against God. And so when we look at Babylon, Babylon represents satanic influence over world powers. Now I want you to think about that. It's a satanic influence over world powers, whether political or military. It could be either one or economic, which Babylon in the New Testament there in Revelation is talking about how everybody traded with the city of Babylon. And so it's this world system that's set up against God that is corrupt, proud, pleasure-seeking, immoral, and always opposed to God. And it's important to understand that we live in that realm, this realm of Babylon today. And so with that background, I want to look at this short passage of Scripture today dealing with ancient Babylon, but also in mind looking at the bigger picture of the Babylon we live in today as well. And I'm going to start with verses 1 through 5. Come down, virgin daughter of Babylon, and sit in the dust. For your days of sitting on the throne have ended. O daughter of Babylon, never again will you be the lovely princess, tear, tender and delicate. Take heavy millstones and grind flour. Remove your veil and strip off your robe. Expose yourself to public view. You will be naked and burdened with shame. I will take vengeance against you without pity. Our Redeemer, whose name is the Lord of Heaven's army, is the Holy One of Israel. O oh, beautiful Babylon, sit now in darkness and silence. Never again will you be known as the queen of kingdoms. Again, the imagery here is that of a queen 
who is high and lifted up and lofty on their throne, who is being deposed and forced to be stripped naked and do slave labor, grinding in a millstone. You see, this would be horribly dreadful for any proud, self-absorbed person. And that was exactly the case of Babylon. If you've studied history, Babylon was one of the ancient wonders of the world. Have you ever heard of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? The city of Babylon was a wonder that had been built by Nebuchadnezzar. It was the pristine thing of pleasure. I mean, it was a place that had all modern conveniences that were unheard of in that day and time. And they were destroyed and taken into captivity. And see, the same thing can be said of Satan. And again, Satan offers these things that Babylon offered as well. He offers, you know, security and pleasure and purpose and meaning and all that. But all of it's a facade and will be gone and taken away in a moment. It will all be burned up. And that's what we hear from Jesus in the Bible in regards to that. And so Satan as well will be defeated and cast into hell when Christ returns. And that war will be over. The Lord tells us next in this passage why He's bringing this destruction on Babylon. And I want you to look at what He talks about here as we look at it. He says, For I was angry with my chosen people and punished them by letting them fall into your hands. And again, we have looked at this and studied this. That God used Babylon to bring discipline upon His people. He actually does that. And again, that's one of the things we've talked about in this passage dealing with Cyrus. He was a pagan king that God anointed and would use to bring destruction on Babylon and set His people free. But you, Babylon, showed them no mercy. You oppressed even the elderly. You said, I will reign forever as queen of the world. You did not reflect on your actions or think about their consequences. Again, when Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem, history records the gruesomeness and the horribleness and the death and destruction and the famine that took place there. And there was absolutely no mercy at all by the hand of Babylon. And I just want to read one verse from Chronicles that speaks to that. So the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them. The Babylonians killed Judah's young men, even chasing after them into the temple. They had no pity on the people, killing both young men and young women, the old and the infirm. And so... Even though God had raised up Babylon to discipline and punish Judah and Jerusalem, they went far beyond God's plan and treated people cruelly. And they destroyed uh, all the Jews without any mercy at all. But see, that has occurred over and over again throughout history, hasn't it? And see, we see this is again an image of the demonic realm. Satan's dominion on the world, where world powers don't just conquer people, but they slay the innocent, those that are no threat to them at whatever. You see, Satan is out to destroy and kill every human being. We don't have an inkling of how evil Satan is. And people say, well, Satan will just leave me alone if I just do this. No, he won't. He is ruthless and he wants to destroy every human being any way he can. And he uses world powers to do that. And he doesn't take anyone captive. And that's why we see inhumane activity throughout the world. So we can look at Babylon here. It's a personification and has been throughout history of the demonic power that is cruel. Next slide. Not caring about human life. 
There's a cruelty that's out there that goes beyond. Again, we are capable of all kinds of evil. Don't get me wrong. Even without Satan. Humanity is cruel and, and wicked. But there is a level that you see with Satan. And again, just one example of that we can be found about a century ago in World War II where Nazi Germany and Japan, those two world powers, they performed cruelty on a level that just appalled the whole world with the concentration, the Holocaust, and what they did there and what they did in Korea. Many of you don't know, but I've been to the Holocaust Museum in Korea. What they did to the Koreans, the Japanese, was just as bad as what the Germans did. And it is a level of wickedness that's hard for us to imagine. But here's the thing we need to realize. And I've done studies and I've, I've read things on Germans after the Holocaust who could believe that they were so appalling and were able to do that. See, I think that we are all capable of falling into the hands of Satan and being cruel. And we need to understand that. It's not just those guys. Everyone is capable of it. And that is the wickedness of human nature, but also the power of the demonic realm with Satan. So the first reason that God said He will wipe out Babylon and there would never be a kingdom again is because of their lack of mercy and cruelty that they had. The next reason we see in verse 8. Listen to this, you pleasure-loving kingdom. Living at ease and feeling secure. You say, I am the only one and there is no other. I will never be a widow or lose my children. I want you to look at this verse. What does Babylon say? I am the only one and there is no other. Does that sound familiar? See, this is what God declares of Himself. And yet Babylon is making this statement that they are seated above God and all human beings. See, that's what pride will do. Pride will elevate somebody beyond the realm of just seeing us as equal. And the thing is, we all can fall into that trap, can't we? But that's what the fall of Satan in heaven was. As I've studied it, and there's not a lot of information in the Bible, but that passage we read, Satan, what I understand, was created the most glorious of beings, of the angelic beings in heaven. And God had put him in charge of many things. But the Bible says his heart became proud, and he thought he could overthrow God. And so he gathered those who would follow him and decided to wage a war in heaven to overthrow God. By the way, that war didn't last long. It was very small and inconsequential. And we need to understand this about Satan. He is a powerful foe, but he has no strength against the Lord, the creator of the universe. And just like flicking a bug off of your hand, he just flipped him out of heaven and cast him to the earth. But again, their pride was part of that. And their seeming that they could do anything they wanted to, and there were no consequences. I will never be a widow. I'll never lose my children. In other words, I am establishing this. I am all-powerful. I can do anything I want to, and there is no one who can stop me. And again, both of these represent the Babylon of the world and Satan as that dominion. But the very thing they pronounce will happen in only a moment. And that's what we see next in verses 9 through 11. Well, both of these things will come upon you in a moment. Widowhood and the loss of your children. Yes, these calamities will come upon you despite all your witchcraft and magic. You felt secure in your wickedness. No one sees me, you said. But your wisdom and knowledge have led you astray. And you said, 
I am the only one and there is no other. Do you notice, see what's going on here? They have lifted themselves up to God. So disaster will overtake you and you won't be able to charm it away. Calamity will fall on you and you won't be able to buy your way out. A catastrophe will strike you suddenly, one for which you are not prepared for. Now I want you, I want to go back to ancient Babylon for just a minute. The city of Babylon was considered the most impenetrable fortress that had ever been in the nation in the ancient world. Its walls were 85 feet thick. Now if you want a picture of 85 feet, it is the length of this building. I remember when we built it. From the front to the back, that's how wide the thickness of the walls. But guess how high they were? 335 feet high. You're talking about a massive fortress. And it had 250 defense towers around the walls. Impenetrable. And again, you had the Euphrates River with fresh water coming through the city and storehouses of food that they could hold up on a siege for years and years and years to come. They were protected and they were secure and they were impenetrable. Sort of. You know how Cyrus defeated them? They went upriver a little ways and diverted the Euphrates River. Now I want you to think about this. Talk about pompous pride. They didn't even know it was going on. You'd think that somebody in the city would say, the river's going down. But see, that's what pride does. And while they're having this huge party, which is recorded in Daniel 5, by the way, they're having this huge party and getting drunk and having this massive party, the river goes down and Cyrus and his army walks under the walls and conquers the cities just like that. Overnight. How quickly they fell. But see, that is also the way that people live their lives. They think that this will go on forever. Matter of fact, there are people who scoff at the Lord's return. Saying everything continues as it has since the day of creation. Where is this Jesus and He's coming? And people mock that and they have throughout history. But Jesus records that when He comes, it will be like this. Look what He says in Matthew. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in the days of Noah. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. By the way, we don't know a lot about the time before the flood. This is about the only verse we have. But it sounded like they were doing it the same after the flood, right? People are just living their lives, no care for God. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. People are going to be partying and living up life and thinking there's no accountability and boom, He comes. But you know that day has waited for a lot of years and we don't know when it will be. I'm not a gloom and doom preacher. I don't know when the Lord will return. It could be a millennium from now. It could be tomorrow. But I do know this. Our time here, and we sang about it in one of our songs, is limited. And we do not know when our last day will be. Death could come at any point. And the Bible said it is appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. And so we are to live our lives with the knowledge that we may be here for a long time. and We may not be here this afternoon. And we need to live our lives in light of that rather than with a demonic attitude that says, I can do anything I want and there is no consequences to my actions. We conclude this passage of uh, Isaiah, where God now turns and mocks Babylon. The commentary says it's actually taunting Babylon and their gods. 
Look at this passage together with me. Now use your magic charms. Oh, use the spells you've worked all these years. By the way, have the magic spells worked all these years? Not a one. Maybe they will do you some good. Oh, maybe they can make someone afraid of you. All the advice you receive has just made you tired. Where are all your astrologers? Those stargazers who make predictions each month. By the way, their predictions are like the weatherman. It's a 50-50 whether it's really going to happen. Let them stand up and save you from what the future holds. But they're like straw burning in a fire. They cannot save themselves from the flame, and you will get no help from them at all. Their hearth is no place to sit for warmth. And, this is an addition, all your friends, those whom you've done business with since children, childhood, they'll go their own way, turning a deaf ear to your cries. And so, the gods of Babylon, which, again, this one last poke at them. By the way, those gods you served, oh, by the way, they've been so good to you all these years. Think about it. They haven't done anything. By the way, isn't that the way it is with idolatry? We can invest, 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 invest in our idols, and do they ever actually bring any results? No. I remember a story about Howard Hughes. How many of you know who Howard Hughes was? He was a multi-billionaire one time, was the richest man in the world, lived in the last century. And the story goes that someone came to him and said, Mr. Hughes, when have you made enough money? When is it enough? You know what his answer was? One dollar more. It never is enough. And so we need to understand this passage, not just dealing with ancient Babylon, but dealing with the world we live in today. Our idols will not satisfy. And by the way, our so-called friends, when we get in trouble, where do they go? They just somehow disappear. They don't answer their phone anymore. You know, they're just not available. That's the way of the world. But here's the thing that I want to bring up, and I think it's important for us to realize. Though idols in themselves are nothing, we've established that. And we've talked about that for several weeks. But behind the idols is something else. You know what it is? The demonic, the demons that are there that attach themselves to us and we become slaves to our idols and our sin. And they can bring great harm to those who worship Him and follow Him. And I want to just bring up one more example because I believe this is the number one idol in our culture that we live in today. And it's what Jesus says about money. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And again, that's the issue that we see with that idol, but that's the case with every idol. You see, either we are serving God or we're serving our idols, which we need to understand when we're serving our idols, guess what we're serving? We're serving Satan because he is the one behind it. There's not any neutral ground. Our hearts are being devoted to him or they're not. And that's why Paul says this regarding money and that idol. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation or are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. 
For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Now I want to properly exegete that passage real quickly. The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. How many of you ever heard that? That's a lie. Money's neutral. It's neither good nor bad. But when we make money our God, we love money above all else and we're pursuing that. When we do that, everything else pales and we will do whatever it is to grab that and have that. We don't ever see that in the world, do we? Do you ever see greed hurt anybody? No. But see, that is the reality that that idol brings. And it's just one of many. But understand behind it is demonic because it promises to deliver something it never can deliver. And we all can fall trapped to that. But it will not be there on the day you die. And it really can't help you in between now, men. And so Paul challenges us with how we are to live. I started meeting with Bo this week. Bo is finishing up his Master Divinity degree and he has to have a mentor. And, and so they picked me because there's nobody else around in Southwest Colorado. And we were visiting on Friday. And one of the courses he's taken is missions. And as we were talking about missions on Friday, the reality is that every person is a missionary. You see, there are some, like Bridget, that goes to Vanuatu. But most of us are missionaries where we live. We never move. And I think a really good interpretation of Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, is that as we go, it's not intentionally going out to visit with somebody, but as we go, wherever we are, we are to be missionaries. We are to live our lives and present Christ. And that's why it's so important that we've got our hearts right and we're trusting in God because the world's watching us every moment of the day. And are we hypocritical in saying one thing and doing another? And so Paul challenges us with whatever we're doing in our lives, wherever we are, whether we're working or in school or going to our neighbor's or wherever we are, we are to represent Christ. And he says this in Colossians. He says, first of all, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. By the way, you cannot give something you don't have. Teach and counsel each other with all with the wisdom he gives. By the way, that is compelling that we need to gather together, don't we? for worship, for study. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. You see, gathering together to worship is very important because we are sending a message from our hearts to God. You know, I wish I could serenade my wife with love songs, but she would throw up. <laughs> But you see the movies, you see the guy with the guitar and, you know, he's serenading the woman and she falls for him. That didn't happen with us. Uh, but there is a truth behind that, that we are to worship God. And I sit over here in my little corner by myself, singing and worshiping God so I don't make you throw up. But I can tell you this, it is one of my highlights every week, is to worship the Lord through song and hymns and lift my heart to Him in thanksgiving for what He's done. 
And when we are living that life, here's the last part. And whatever you do or say, what does that entail? Everything. Do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Guess what kingdom we are to represent? It's not the demonic realm. It's the realm of Jesus in His kingdom. Giving thanks through Him to God the Father. You see, wherever we are, we are living in Satan's realm. Acknowledge it. Don't be surprised at what happens in the world. It's always been demonic and fallen. That's the world we live in. But we represent a new kingdom. And that is the kingdom of Christ. And we are to live that kingdom in such a way that the world knows that we represent Him. Last week, I challenged us when we came to communion to think about our idols. I think we all have them. And I challenged us to pray and make a commitment to set them aside and walk away from them. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'll just speak to myself. There were two that specifically I dealt with last week. And you know what? I made every commitment to get rid of them and out of my life, and this week they raised their ugly head again. Anybody else ever struggle with that? Now, does that mean we throw up our hands and we quit and we walk away? No. What it means is that we are to lay those things before the Lord and let Him give us the strength to overcome. I've mentioned to you before my history. And today's another anniversary for me. And I looked at the calendar. And I've been off a day for a long time. I didn't realize it. Do you know the 1979 calendar is exactly the same calendar we have this year? Yeah. January 28th fell on a Sunday. And I looked at it this week because I knew it was coming up. You know where I woke up on January 28th, 1979? In a jail cell. I got a DUI that night. Oh my, how God has changed me. He set me free from alcohol 45 years ago. Now I wish I could say the same about all the other things I've struggled with. But as I share with people, the man that woke up in that jail cell 45 years ago is not the man standing before you. Because of God's grace and His mercy, He has changed me. And one of my sayings that I say about myself is, by the grace of God, I'm no longer the man I used to be. That man isn't alive anymore. Every once in a while he'll raise his ugly head, but he doesn't stay there very long. That self-centered, selfish alcoholic person who didn't care about anybody including himself is gone by the grace of God. But there's another part of that staying that I think is very important. And I hope that this will become your saying as well. By the grace of God, I'm no longer the person I used to be. And by the grace of God, I'm not the person I'm going to be. I read in my devotional this morning, I read... Spurgeon every morning, I've done it for the last couple of years, his daily devotional, and he talked about this morning, the not yet. The struggle in this realm that we have with sin. And sometimes we despair and we want to give up and we want to quit and we just, ugh. But we need to remember that we've already been declared not guilty and we have already been set free from sin and we have already achieved and God looks at us now as if we were perfect and someday we will be perfect. 
That's that day itself still to come. And while we breathe air on this realm, we will always struggle with the flesh and we will always struggle with the devil. He actually used the verse this morning. He said the, the, the pride of life, the pride of the eyes and the pride, I can't even remember it. Forgot it. That's what happens. You know, I'll skip that verse. Somebody can quote it for me. But anyway, we will struggle in this world. But as Revelation said, they overcame, how? By the blood of the Lamb, Jesus' death, and the word of their testimony. God's doing something in my life. And He's not finished yet, and He promises to finish it. And I believe and I'm seeing God doing things in your lives. By the grace of God, He will complete that as well. And so as we come to communion this morning, I want to just give you an opportunity to pray. And as I've talked about before, communion is an opportunity for us to confess sin and start afresh each week. And maybe the same booger that was on your shoulder last week is there again, you got to flick it off. I don't know. Maybe you're still struggling with the same things. But it's an opportunity to confess that to the Lord, surrender again to the Lord, and watch God do His thing. Because one Sunday you're going to show up for communion, and that's not going to be the thing anymore. By the grace of God. And there are a lot of those things that are no longer a part of my life that used to be. So I want to just give you an opportunity to just spend some time in prayer. And then we're going to come and get communion and take it together and close the service this morning. Remind you of your past, remind him of his future. <laughs> but we're in a war, aren't we? And we laugh, but it's a real war. And it's for our souls, but it's for kingdoms. There are two kingdoms at war. And will be till the end of time. And it's Satan's realm, that realm where Babylon was, and we're going to talk about it next week one more time before we move to the last section or the next section of Isaiah. But that realm is very enticing. And there's always the temptation to follow that realm. But we need to know the end of that realm. It's all going to be burned up. None of it will last. And we need to invest our lives, and that's what Jesus said in that passage that I quoted from Matthew 6. Invest in eternity. Make that the goal of your life. Why? Because that's the realm that gives life its abundance here, but also gives the rewards forever. And again, it's not because we accomplish anything. It's because of what Christ did. And that's why we need to be reminded when we come to communion. My efforts will fail over and over and over again. But when I am walking in the Spirit, surrendered to the Holy Spirit, and allowing Him to guide my life, I will have victory. And it's a victory that I gain because of Christ and His work on the cross. And the thing that keeps us from pride, which was one of the downfalls of Babylon, is always remembering from where we came. I shared my story, but I'm sure you got your stories as well. I just happen to have the microphone this morning. But we all have a story to tell. And it's a story about Christ coming 
and saving a wretched sinner and transforming a wretched sinner into a saint that's in progress. Emphasis on the last part. And so we never become proud. We never lofty. We never say, I have built this. Look what I have done. It should always be, look what God has done. And that's a part of what communion is about. Is as we overcome, we give glory to God. Jesus said, when you take the bread, remember my body that hung on that cross for you. Humiliated, naked, ashamed, dying for you so that you might have life. Let's eat. And when you take the cup, you remember that that is the cup of the new covenant. It says in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But the cup, of, the cup represents a new kingdom, a kingdom that was established with Christ's death, that we are now a part of. Even as we live in this earthly realm that's demonic, we're a part of a new kingdom. And it's the kingdom of God that we celebrate together this drink. As we look at our benedictory verse, I want to just remind us of that before we pray. This has been our verse that we have close the service with almost every Sunday for the last year. And we're going to be there soon. But that is the central message of Isaiah. It is the soon to come, the not yet, and the still to come. And it's interesting that we all live in that realm each day in our lives, don't we? It's the soon to come, the not yet, looking into the future, and then looking far into the future when the kingdom of God will be fully established and we will be a part of that forever. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you as we've been on this journey through Isaiah. We see that you are the one, the only God, the creator of the universe, the only one that is worthy of worship, the only one that's worthy of surrender to, the only one that's worthy to be followed. And Lord, help us to remove every semblance of every idol in our lives that we can follow you with the whole heart. And yet even as we pray that, we know that we will still struggle. But Lord, you are bigger than our struggles. And you will help us overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And so guide us this week that we would have victory in the things that we do, the things that we say, and the lives that we live. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and close with our benediction and have a wonderful week. It was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. And yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.